It was a winter day in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Probably a little bit more wintry than this because they had called off church in the 1890s. Not over the internet, obviously. <laughs> and Amos Herr went to go do chores. And as he crossed his, from his house to his barn, he was overwhelmed by the beauty of God and God's care for him. And he penned a song. I owe the Lord a morning song. And I think we all owe the Lord a morning song. Would you join Hannah and me in singing this a cappella, 651. Amos Herr was a Mennonite, also a pastor in his church in Lancaster County. Let's sing these words together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we are safely here. We pray for those who do not feel this safety or aren't within this presence. Lord, may you reach out to them as you've reached out today in this place. Lord, we enter your sanctuary with praise on our lips, with hopes, with fears, with dreams. Lord, may your Holy Spirit touch each of them and welcome us deeper into your presence. And all of God's people said, Amen. invite someone into God's presence. In Galatians we read, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And that is the beauty of starting a new year, no matter what the old year was like. I just heard the statistics that January 12th is the average time that most of us give up on our, uh, on our uh, New Year's resolutions. <laughs> even so, you are welcome here. And even so, you are in Christ. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Let's proclaim those words in song.
If you remain standing and join with me in reciting the words of Proverbs 826 in your worship books, or you can follow along up there, I will read the regular print, you the bold, and together we'll end. Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 6. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Let's sing the words of Psalm 145. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Okay, guys, today we are reading Toot and Puddle, the new friend. And in this book, Opal has a new friend come to visit who is good at a lot of things, and she's a lot different than Opal. And Opal learns that um, everybody's different, everybody's good at different things. And just because they're different, they can still be really good friends. Okay. Thank you, J2. On a Sunday, um, on a sunny day in October, Opal came to Woodcock Pocket for a visit, and she brought along her new friend Daphne. Isn't Daphne beautiful? Opal said. She's quite pretty, said Puddle, smiling at the new friend. Can you guys see the pictures? Do you want to come up a little bit so you can see better? Okay. Daphne did perfect cartwheels. She could stand on her head perfectly, and she could do a backflip. You certainly are talented, Toot told her. I'll never be that good at gymnastics, said Opal. No one jumps rope better than Daphne, said Opal. Faster, cried Daphne, faster. Ah. What shall we do for fun tonight, Puddle asked. I know, Toot said. Let's see who can stand on one leg the longest. One, two, three, go! Daphne cried excitedly. <coughs> Toot wobbled and soon tipped over. Opal plunked flat on her bottom. Finally, Puddle lost his balance too. The last one standing on one leg was Daphne. 
Let's see who can hold their breath the longest, Puddle suggested next. One, two, three, go, shouted Daphne. Puddle was the first to give up this time, then Opal, and finally even Toot. The last one left holding her breath was little Daphne. I don't know how you do it, Puddle said. It's easy, Daphne said. I just do it. <laughs> For the evening's entertainment, Opal performed bird songs. She imitated an owl and a crow and a duck. Hoo-hoo, she went. Ka, ka, quack, quack, quack. Toot and Puddle clapped and whistled. <laughs> Can you do the nightingale? Daphne asked. That's my favorite. But Opal didn't know the nightingale song. When it was Daphne's turn to perform, she played a Mozart violin concerto perfectly. That was beautiful, said Opal. Lovely, Puddle agreed. Delightful, Toot chimed in. You certainly are musical. Daphne took a bow. Take a bow. Yeah, good job. Sometimes I wish I was as good at things as Daphne is, said Opal. Okay, so thumbs up if you ever felt that way. If you felt like you, you really wish you were as good at something as somebody else. Yep. <laughs> everyone is different and everyone is good at different things, Puddle told her. You are you and Daphne is Daphne. But she's better at everything, said Opal. Hmm. Do you guys think that's true? Let's, let's read and we'll find out. In the morning, Opal and Daphne drew pictures of themselves with crayons and they asked Toot and Puddle to be art judges. Who made the best self-portrait? Hmm, Puddle said, they're just completely different. They are, Toot agreed. Opal's picture is more realistic and Daphne's is less realistic. I know, Daphne said, I like less realistic. Okay, so there's the two drawings. They are very different, aren't they? But I think they're both good in their own way. At lunch, everyone played Go Fish, which was Opal's favorite card game. She won three times in a row. Hooray, she cheered. It's my lucky day. I'm bored, Daphne said. I quit. Mm, that's not very nice, is it? For supper, Puddle made noodles with his favorite homemade dandelion sauce. But Daphne said... I don't like dandelion sauce. Puddle makes the best, said Opal. Just try one bite, Toot coaxed. I want mine plain, Daphne said. Hmm. I think your friend is a bit of a prima donna, Toot said. <laughs> What's a prima donna, Opal asked. Someone who thinks she is overly special, Puddle explained, like the biggest shooting star in the sky. Well, I think Daphne is overly special, was Opal's reply. Hmm. But in the morning, Daphne refused to eat Toot's delicious oatmeal. I never have oatmeal, she huffed. I usually have pancakes with syrup. Later, the new friend refused to help rake leaves. Come on, Daphne, Puddle called. Raking leaves is piles of fun. I can't, Daphne said. I might get a blister. Ooh. Have you guys ever known somebody like that? Who refused to help out even? Maybe you are a prima donna, Opal said. Her pink face flushed pinker. What's that? Opal asked. I've never heard of it. It's someone who thinks she is so special she won't even help rake leaves. Well, maybe someone just doesn't like to get blisters, Opal said, because they sting like mad especially if she needs to practice violin. Everyone was enjoying the quiet end of the day when a scary high-pitched squeal filled the house. Ah! Where's Daphne? Puddle asked anxiously. She went to take a bubble bath, Opal told her. Toot was first out of his chair. Oh, goodness, look. Look, Daphne cried, shivering. A creepy crawly. Holy moly, Puddle shouted. That's a big one. Nothing to fear, Toot declared. I'm scared, 
said Daphne in a small, shaky voice. She was on the brink of tears. I'm really scared. But Opal seemed positively thrilled. And what a big, beautiful spider you are, she said excitedly. You guys like spiders? No. Some of you said yes, some of you said no. After Opal had coaxed the creepy crawly into a glass jar, she took it outside to the wood pile. I hope you enjoy your new home, Mr. Spider. Bye-bye. You were so brave with that spider, Daphne said. I wish I could be that brave. I bet you could be, said Opal. No, Daphne said. Spiders give me goosebumps. But don't you like spider webs? Opal asked. Spiders are the only things that can make them. Daphne had to admit that she had never seen one. You have to be on the lookout to spot one, Opal told her. I have an idea, Daphne said. Let's who see who can fall asleep the fastest. One, two, three, go. In no time, Daphne was sound asleep. Her snoring sounded like the purr of a cat. Opal wasn't ready to go to sleep yet. She wanted to stay awake and gaze at the night sky, as she often did when she came to Woodcock Pocket. There was always something to see. So just remember that even though you're different, you can still be good friends. And everyone is good at different things, and you guys may go. Do you want to carry this? Luke chapter 13, uh, verse 18 through 21. Jesus said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what should I compare it? It is like mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests and branches in its branches. And again, Jesus said, to what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. leavened. So the other day I got a message on Facebook that said, John, I love the message of your videos, but not if it's coming from you. There are choices you've made in your past that render you not qualified to spread such a message. And for me, that was hard to hear because the hypocritical Christian is something I fear. To be put in a category like that, I, I think of nothing worse. So maybe there's something I should have said first. You see, I can't and won't and don't claim to be perfect. In fact, most times I'm not even good. I'll take responsibility for the mistakes I've made and the hurts I've caused. I got more than I probably should. But would God use that against me? Making good coming from my life impossible? Forgives me but refuses to use me? I don't believe in that gospel. I believe in the God of Moses. Moses was an orphan and a murderer with a stutter and a price on his head. Yet God chose this killer to be a fulfiller, performing miracles, leading his people, and making rivers flow red. I believe in the God of David. David, the shepherd boy who turned into a king, a terrible father and an adulterer from the start. Yet even with wrongdoings and iniquity, we remember him as the man after God's own heart. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, living a life without direction. Matthew was a tax collector, the lowest of the low, yet they both walked and talked and witnessed Christ's perfection. Did God choose the Pharisees? 
the self-righteous and pompous full of laws and pretension? Or did he choose cowardly Peter and persecuting Paul to spread the message of Christ's redemption? All these heroes in the Bible, not a one of them was lightly, leaning not on themselves, they leaned on God. And you know what God is? He is mighty. So can God use me, a broken, steaming mess? And can God use him or her or you? I'm here to tell you right now that the answer is yes. God can and will use anybody, even if you only go to church on Christmas. Does he only speak through the preacher? No, God is in a different business because believing in the Lord isn't living a perfect Walgreens life, always doing right. It's letting his light shine from within and letting his word be your tutor. He'll take your broken past, helping you step in to a more hopeful future because it wasn't for perfection that Jesus died on that cross. It was for the unhealthy so the sick could serve the sick and seek and save the lost. Because in the end, these words and these lights and these cameras and this video, it's not about me. It's about God. And with God, it's never about who you were but about who you will be. It's God's story for the world, and we're just playing our parts. So if you're out there feeling not qualified, that's great, because not qualified is where he starts.
I invite you this morning to engage me in one of the most exciting pastor, passages in the whole Bible. It might not look like it right off the bat, but let's see if what I say is true or not. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 from the beginning to verse 17. A recording of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminabab, Aminabab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Sol uh, Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehobim. Rehobim, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud. Abiud was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Achim. Achim was the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar was the father of Methan. Methan was the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Heavenly Father, you have given us this passage today to wrestle with. Open it up now to our living, to our breathing, to our engaging. Open my mouth to speak. Amen. Can you imagine the first time that the child, Jesus, sat down beside his mom and dad and he asked them about their family history. Did Mary blush? Did Joseph squirm? I mean, seriously, how do you explain Tamar, who dressed up like a prostitute and seduced her father-in-law so that she could have a child? Or how much do you tell the boy about the prostitute Rahab who helped the spies in Jericho? Or about Bathsheba who became a queen as a result of an affair and a murder? What do you do as a parent? Do you tell these stories in detail or do you just sort of sweep them under the rug and tell only the good stories about your family and whitewash the story? <laughs> Act like those other stories never happened and skip them all together. Now each of these women, Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, even Ruth was in there, she isn't as risque as the others, are named. They're included in a genealogy of men. Isn't that interesting? You have all these men and then it, the Bible takes time in each of these 14 generations to name the women. Why? Why Tamar? Why Rahab? Why Bathsheba? We don't need to talk about stuff like that. Well, as we talked about it on Wednesday night in our Bible study, we talked about context. In all of these stories, given their context, show women who don't fit the mold but are trying to be faithful. They are the gospel in today's story. 
much more than the men are. Even much more than King David, although King David is part of the problem. Why these women make risky, risque stories. These stories in their context show women trying to be faithful. In fact, for as odious as the plan seems to modern ears, Tamar turned out to be more righteous than her Jewish father-in-law who was upstanding and refused to do the things upstanding because of what the community might think of him. He refused to actually obey what the Old Testament taught about marriage. And so Tamar goes and he, she tries to be faithful into what our modern ears would say, whoa, dude, that's a step too far. You can go read it in Genesis. It's her only way of survival. But still, these stories seem pretty wild at their first telling. What does it mean what does it mean that Jesus comes with such a checkered background? Take a look at your bulletins, or you can take a look at the illustration up there. Your bulletin covers. I want you to take time to write out your genealogy right now. You can start with your mother and father and go backwards. See if you can fill out all the blanks. If you don't have a pencil, you can do it in your mind. Just sit there. Take some time to do it right now. Take just a minute more. All right, now look over those names. I want you to think about the stories and the history that is represented in each of those names. And I want you to ask several questions about that story or that history you have before you. It is sacred history. So who are you, who are you proud of? And why? Who are you angry with? And why? Who doesn't quite fit into the family tree yet? And in some strange way does? And David, you can't say it's me. Do you need to do something about skeletons in the family closet? If so, what? <clears throat> Can you see God's faithfulness through these people? All of these people? How? Is it comforting that Jesus had less than perfect people in his family tree? And finally, this is the act of worship. What are the miracles 
represented there in your family tree? How can you say thanks? Keep this as your act of worship, as this as your act of prayer for the week or the year to come. Now, we joke that for most people, public, the fear of public speaking is more fearful than even death. In fact, there's been some studies that show that people fear public speaking more than they fear dying. But I think what people fear even more is to be in church asked to read scripture with these genealogies you had this morning, because I made up some of those names. <laughs> I didn't make them up, I just you know, sort of flew over them. But uh, we, we fear that. What's the first question when I ask you to read scriptures? Are there any names or uh, uh, Betty, hard, hard things to do? Well, this morning had, was a tongue twister of 77 names. Is there any value in today's genealogy beyond history? Because how many of us, you can admit it, it's sort of like re reading the Lord of the Rings. When you get to the poetry, you skip over it. Right? Maybe I'm the only weird one. But when we get to the names in the Bible, we skip over them. Well, I believe that in the genealogies, God speaks to us of his attention to the individual. God sees us not as a teeming mass of humanity that, that corporately messes things up, that ebbs and flows, but he sees us as an individual, as individual names and faces and personalities, each with our own stories that play into the larger salvation story. When we talk about the salvation story of the Bible, most of us tend to think of it ending ending with maybe Menno Simons at best. But every one of you, no matter who you are, are part of the story of God's redemption in personal name. Some of you might say, I have never been in a history book. I will never be recorded in history. You are recorded in the salvation history of God. God sees you as an individual. God sees these names as important. And I think... They show us that God can use anyone and that God has used anyone, that God does use anyone, and that God will continue to use anyone who is a human being created in the image of God. These names show us that God shows his faithfulness by doing what he says he will do. And every good Jew, when they heard the recitation of these names, would understand that this is the recitation of where I plug into God fulfilling his promises. Working through heroes and hucksters, all far from perfect. Even the heroes are messed up. But no plan of God can be thwarted. Each name surely is a blade of withered grass, but God's purposes endure forever. Every name points to our need of the one who bears the name above all names. Every name recorded and remembered by God gives us assurance that our names are recorded and remembered by our Father as well. And because of this, even the names of Scripture, the long and seemingly boring genealogies, have a purpose. These 77 names testify clearly and loudly on their own. They don't have to be added. They don't have to be uh, somehow congealed with another story because they don't make a passage of themselves. They are a passage in and of themselves on their own. They loudly and clearly testify that God can use me. And God will and can use you. Our God is in the business of naming names. Read them. Celebrate them. For even this, and especially this, is the saving word of God. And all of us, therefore, are qualified.
Wow. Amen. Thank God for our gifts. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and sing a blessing to each other. The Lord lift you up.
twice through, one time for someone not here, second time to someone here, to all of us here. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.